Our speaker this hour is Sage Bridges. Sage is going to continue in the, uh, in the course of leading us through the text of 1 Corinthians, the latter half of 1 Corinthians. He's going to be looking at chapter 10, verses, wait, that's the wrong one. Yeah, chapter 10, verses 14 through 22. Sage uh, works with the Creekside Church of Christ in Greenville, Texas. He's been there for about two and a half years. Uh, he's been married to his wife, Alexis, for eight years, and they have two boys, Carson and Caden. Sage graduated from Bear Valley uh, in December of 2016, and along the way he has worked with congregations in California, Colorado, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, I asked Sage, I said, what else can I say about you? And he said, well, there's not much else. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you drink coffee? And he said, yeah. And I said, uh, great, you and I can be friends. So, uh, and, and thankfully he is not one of those sacrilegious one-cuppers. Uh, he drinks plenty a day, and so I'm looking forward to hearing the spirited, caffeine-filled discussion of 1 Corinthians 10. Sage, come preach the Lord to his brother. I cannot tell you what a blessing it is to be here this morning. Uh, I think about all the different people that are just in this room that are a part of uh, this congregation and this school, uh, and I can just say one thing, and that is it's good to be home. It's, it's really a homecoming for us uh, who have gone away, and I know that the school always intends for preachers to go out and to uh, preach the word in different places, but it's good to be back uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ who have impacted my life in more ways than I can count. When I think about uh, what it is uh, that uh, different people struggle with as far as is why it is that they don't study, maybe perhaps as much as they should, uh, why, it is that, uh, why it is that we don't spend time in the Word, and of course that's already been emphasized so much already in this lectureship, uh, the importance of the Word as it, as it is and how it relates to our spiritual lives, uh, why it is that we don't stu study and why it is that we struggle sometimes. Uh, and really, the first thing that comes to my mind is that it's hard. Uh, studying the Word is hard for so many different reasons. Uh, when we think about uh, you know, approaching the Bible and opening it up for the first time, uh, we immediately are faced with obstacles that have to do with context, and we've talked about some of that already. Uh, it takes time and, and skill and, and learning in order to be able to place Scripture in its context, and that's, a, that's something that takes even years to develop. And, of course, there are other challenges as well. We, when we think about uh, the, the cultural changes and, and the language barrier, there are things that come up that, that make it difficult for us to be able to place ourselves in, in their shoes. What, it is, what is it that they were trying to learn uh, from the things that the apostles, that the prophets were writing to them? And when we look at what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he brings up a number of these questions. Uh, these things that we have to overcome in order to understand the book of 1 Corinthians. Uh, and we, uh, we see that, that it challenges us when he asks questions that, that put us uh, back in a Jewish mindset. Or, or that cause us to want to put ourselves back in a Jewish mindset. What was it like to be a Jew uh, throughout these different times of history? Uh, what was it like to be a Gentile watching all these things uh, take place from their perspective? Of course, uh, we see a, a lot of things in Scripture from the perspective of God's people. But what were the Gentiles thinking? And we think about, okay, well, how is it that the gospel can reach them? And of course, uh, that's one of the tasks, one of the responsibilities that the apostles had. But there are many difficult things that uh, come with studying the Bible, and I'm so glad that you chose to come here to take time to, to, devote, uh, to devote your attention to the study of God's Word, because that's what it's going to take in, in order for us to understand things like paganism. Uh, when we even look back at the pagan culture, and, and maybe even in secular history, we see, again, so many challenges in understanding what it would have been like to be someone who was involved with paganism throughout uh, the course of history. Uh, what was it like to grow up in that type of environment where paganism was a real thing? It was proposed to culture and to ideologies and to mentalities as something that was the reality. 
Governments and, and monarchies and different forms of, of authority made decisions based on their gods and they, and, and they believed in it and they held water in what they believed that those gods had to say. What would it be like to be a part of that culture? And when we look at the book of 1 Corinthians, we see a lot of discussion, a lot of talk about uh, the, the struggle that they had with paganism and overcoming uh, these obstacles of, of dealing with that reality that they face themselves in. Even though we can't fully understand really all the troubles that they must have endured, we can pick up on these different patterns and trends uh, that we find in Scripture, and we see a lot of that uh, in a number of different places. Paul says that, uh, that these... Corinthians needed to understand the difference between the, their relationship with God and the, the societal norm when it came to idolatry. But it seems as though God's people have always struggled with this concept. They've always struggled with idolatry and, and the mindset that, that, that surrounded them and, and what they had to face, even just going into the promised land to fill, fulfill God's pr- promises and hope and future for them. It seems as though idolatry continued to come up time and time again. And you look at places like Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1, where the people were getting frustrated with Moses. Moses uh, went up on the mountain, and this is not long after uh, he had just read the word aloud to the people in Exodus chapter uh, 24. and, And the people responded by saying, everything that you have said, we will do. Uh, and then Moses went up on the mountain, and the people grew impatient, and, and they, they started to talk to Aaron and say, let's make this God uh, that will go before us, let's make this God that essentially uh, will take the place uh, of this God of Moses, because we don't know what Moses is doing, we don't know what uh, is taking him so long, they grew impatient. And, and when we see these trends, these patterns throughout our study in idolatry, We see that they treated deity as though it were malleable or even at times uh, sometimes expendable. Where they could uh, change or adapt to God to be more like them or perhaps more fitting to what their agenda was. Or maybe they just wanted to replace the God altogether. Uh, Regardless of whether or not they wanted to to replace God together, all together in Exodus chapter 32 uh, when they were uh, proposing this idea to, to Aaron... It's irrelevant whether they wanted to replace him altogether or whether they just wanted to change him. It doesn't matter. Because when we express loyalty to something that is other than God's nature, it's not something that's going to result in success. No matter what it is, this conformity is rooted in selfishness. When we look at idolatry and we see the patterns that God's people face time and time again dealing with his struggle, we see that self-interest is really at the center of idolatry. And scripture connects this on more than one occasion. In the book of Colossians, Paul, in chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, uh, he says that greed amounts to idolatry. Uh, in another book, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul uh, would go on to say that, that, uh, that someone who covets, someone who struggles with the idea of, of wanting something that someone else has and, and coveting after that, that's something that is idolatry and that's something that the church should stay away from. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes the point that a person can really only truly love One master, you cannot serve God and wealth because when you serve both, you are dividing your attention. You're dividing your loyalties to one God versus the other. As the brother before us spoke just a moment ago, it is true uh, that there are things uh, that may be difficult for us to understand as far as relating to a pagan culture, but, but paganism and, and idolatry and those things are still very prevalent today, whether we recognize it or not. And Paul says that, that idolatry is a part of this self-interest mindset, this self-interest motivation, and you as God's people need to overcome that. In some level of participation, in some level of this type of division, is it acceptable to go on and, and to live out as a part of our Christian life? 
What God told Israel is the same thing that God is going to tell the church at Corinth. There in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 14. In order for you to dwell in God's presence, or even more specifically in this text, for you to uh, partake of the Lord's Supper, you're going to have to... Uh, you're going to have to dissipate, you're going to have to get rid of some of these other unions. As Paul begins to address this division problem with the church in Corinth, he's already made them aware of these unhealthy unions that they are currently partaking in. He said, you have this unhealthy healthy union with other men. Now, this is not talking about uh, their fellowship as brothers in Christ and, and their, their Christian camaraderie. He's saying that you have this unhealthy union and that you mistake following them for following Christ. And that is something that's a problem. That union needs to be something that's done away with. The problem that you have with sexual immorality going down later on in the book, he says you cannot join Christ, the body, with a prostitute. And he says this union is something that needs to go away. It needs to be done away with. It is an unhealthy part of your relationship. He says you cannot join a temple with something that is unholy. Likewise, Christians cannot kiss forward sacrifices to idols and still be loyal to God. This entire passage we'll be, that we'll be examining is a conclusion based on the example uh, that, God's ex, or that God uh, cannot cooperate with idols and this idea that God's relationship, we'll turn to the next slide, God, our relationship with God, our participation with God is something that's exclusive and fully embracing the exclusivity of our relationship with God is, is difficult because of our loyalties to these other areas, to these other parts of the world, these, these other influences that we have in our life. But throughout, uh, for, or through first doing some reasoning and some remembrance, we'll start to realize how exclusive our relationship would be with God and how that will make the church in Corinth a healthier congregation for the Lord. We're going to look at three different ways on how we can embrace this exclusivity. If you go ahead and flip to the next slide. We, we embrace the exclusivity when we, number one, reason ourselves away from idolatry. In the previous section, we see uh, variations of this repetitious phrase. Uh, when we see that word therefore at the beginning of the section in verse 14, that should always draw us back to what was said previously. And he, and he uh, uses this phrase, uh, as some of you did, or as some of you are, or as some of you were, to indicate uh, this pattern that idolatrous mindset has produced in them. He says in chapter 10 and verse 7, do not be idolaters as some of them were. In chapter 10 and verse 8, do not act immorally as some of them did. Chapter 10, verse 9, do not try the Lord as some of them did. Chapter 10, verse 10, do not grumble as some of, some of them did. And as you go back through Israel's history, as we just looked at uh, in the previous hour, and we see that God is not bringing up the sins of Israel to recount their shame with no purpose. He's doing so so that you, as God's people, as his church, can see these patterns, can see these, these failures, if you will, and pointing them out to you so that you don't make the same mistakes. And he says that, that you will see, hopefully, uh, past their mistakes and, and be able to learn from them and, and, and avoid these failures so that you can uh, see that God is always trying to provide you this way of escape, as he says down in verse 13. It says, as some of them did, as those people who abandoned God's ways and conformed to what was going on around them, he says, I hope and expect better from you, church at Corinth. And he says, therefore, in chapter 10 and verse 14, flee from idolatry. Now we see Paul begin this section with two imperatives, two commands that go hand in hand. This idea of fleeing from idolatry in verse 14. In this command, he starts uh, by reminding them of his motivations. As Paul uh, would later recount in, in 2 Corinthians, he says uh, that, that he was harsh on them, and he did so because he loved them, and he cared about them, and he addresses them as his beloved. He says, 
I'm telling you this because I care about you, because I love you, and because I want you to be successful. He says, therefore, flee idolatry. When we find ourselves in dangerous situations, there really are uh, only two res responses uh, in most cases. Either, flee, or either, um, either fight or flight. And when we uh, can maybe recall a dangerous situation in our life, that, that's a response that, it, depending on the circumstances, one or the other may be necessary. But what he's saying is actually, in this case, the flight is the fight. He's saying flee from idolatry, and in doing so, you are going to destroy its persuasion, not just among the church in Corinth, but to those on the outside. We see that happening in the book of Acts in chapter 19 when Paul was going about preaching the gospel and, and as, he, as their influence grew and as they started to convince more people, those who were making idols, the idol production of the actual physical representation of what it was that they worshipped. So that was starting to become destroyed, that was hurting them. And he says, you church in Corinth, if you don't flee from idolatry, it's going to fester and, it, and it's going to grow says, flee from idolatry. The flight is the fight. And number two, as you continue down, he says, judge to judge what he says. To reason. He teaches the church in Corinth that when we flee from idolatry, in their presence, it's going to be something that causes them, uh, or that prevents them from, or prevents them from becoming defiled. First Corinthians chapter eight and verse seven. But second, Paul commands them to judge what he says there in verse fifteen. The New American Standard Bible here in verse fifteen uh, translates uh, this word as wise. It says there uh, uh, to for for basically as wise men judge what I say. And and when we look at this word wisdom, this is not the the first time Paul brings this up in the book, but it's actually a different word uh, than what has been used in previous chapters. Because if you look in the first couple of chapters, he, he talks about the natural person. Uh, and he says that the natural person is not ready for the spiritual food uh, the, of spiritual wisdom because they are still focused on the things of the flesh. And he says, focus on spiritual wisdom in contrast to that. And, and, he's, and he's saying, I could not address you as spiritual people because you are not wise in accordance to the spirit, in accordance to spiritual discernment. But this word wisdom is more of a word that means to be prudent uh, or to be sensible. And of course, there's some overlap with that idea of wisdom. Uh, but he's appealing to them from even more of a basic way. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, different people being preached, uh, the, to the, uh, being uh, presented the gospel for the first time, uh, you see a very basic appeal. You see, one of the reasons why we believe in the good news is because we in our hearts and our minds have reasoned to understand that there's bad news. We become convinced uh, of following the good news because we understand what the bad news is, and that is that we are lost without Jesus Christ. See, it takes a very small discernment, a very basic understanding for us to draw that conclusion. And he says that even as weaker Christians struggle with their spiritual discernment, you should be able to reason in this way. He says, Just judge what I say. Paul is commanding them uh, to test what he says, uh, and he's going to present them with this sensible evidence. Uh, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the, the popularity of smoking reached its peak in 1950. Uh, ironically, just prior to that, about circa 1940, uh, the, a doctor, and I'm not going to try to say his name because I, I butcher, butcher it every time I try to say it, but a doctor was starting to piece together uh, the idea of smoking being the cause of this lung cancer epidemic. Now, uh, they... They took, it took a lot of time for the American people to catch on uh, to the link there. Uh, and, and as we um, think about how long it took them to see the evidence uh, and to draw the conclusion that maybe smoking is the reason I can't breathe. Maybe smoking is the reason why so many around us are dying of lung cancer. 
It really seems ridic ridiculous to us in hindsight. Why? Because uh, we just know it is common knowledge, but to them it was brand new information. But as the evidence became more and more substantial, and, and maybe even personal examples in their lives uh, stuck out as, as those who maybe breathed in more smoke than, than fresh air uh, and started to suffer the health repercussions of that, uh, they started to put together the evidence that there's something that was presented to them in a cultural way as something that was okay and, and not bad for you is something that is actually harming them. See, when it comes to idolatry and kind of trying to immerse ourselves in their mindset to understand how difficult it would have been to flee from idolatry, to escape it, to run from that temptation, they needed to be persuaded with reason. The only way that we are going to flee from the idolatry that we find in our culture today is if we are persuaded with reason. If we test the things that Paul says and, and say, look, think about it, what it is that you are doing. Think about how these things cannot coexist together. So he says, flee from idolatry. Reason yourselves away from idolatry, number one. Number two, remember the significance of participation. We will embrace the exclusivity when we, when we fully understand what it means to participate uh, in these things that we're about to discuss here in this section. What does it truly represent? What does it truly mean? Well, just like these Christians who are already uh, been a part of the Lord's church. They've been taught by Paul previously. They've, they've been shown the scriptures. They've been taught what it is that they are to do when they are partaking of the Lord's Supper. They've been shown how to do it, and they have a history uh, of doing this. How much history, we don't know, and maybe it's specific to the individual. But regardless, they were still failing to understand what it is that was expected of them and what it truly meant to partake of this act of worship. See, when we, are, when we partake of the Lord's Supper... It's not just a matter of doing everything in the act correctly itself. We talk a lot about, uh, you know, the need to keep the emblems as a part of the New Testament pattern. And we talk about the need of, of focusing when we come here together, when we assemble as a part of the church, uh, what we do in the act of worship itself. But what Paul is going to relate this to is not just the act itself, and the fact that you can do everything right on that day but still miss the point. Because the Lord's Supper is connected and intertwined with everything else that we do throughout the week. As we continue down, we see that they are going to need to, uh, they're need to, going to, need to examine the way that they're partake, not only partaking of the Lord's Supper, but what it means uh, for them as they go out about living their everyday lives. Here we find two examples that are connected by this idea of participation. Next slide, please. We see two examples. Uh, one is participation in the emblems. And, and Paul's going to relate this directly to them. He's going to talk about what it is that they should already be familiar with. He says, is it not the cup, looking down uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 16, is it not the cup of blessings which we bless, uh, a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is it not the bread which we break, a sharing in the body of Christ? Talking about uh, these, different, uh, these different parts of the act of worship. And he talks about both of them. So, okay, examine the way that you partake of, uh, of the blood. He says, when you partake of that, are you not participants in the blood of Christ, as you drink that, that juice, that, fr that, grape fr uh, that grape juice, as you partake of that, are you not participants of the blood of Christ? And he says, are you not partaking of the body? Now, when we look at what those uh, each individually mean, we see that the, the blood represents that covenant. As we look uh, in Hebrews chapter 9, that, that inaugurated a new covenant, that which covers our sins. And, of course, the body of Christ represents that which he suffered and died, that flesh, that sinless flesh that hung on the cross uh, as a part of the ministry of reconciliation, that which God had in his mind from eternity. And he's saying, do you not know what it means when you participate in those emblems? 
He says it's not just the act of taking that cup of juice and putting it in your mouth. It's not just you fulfilling everything correctly on that first day of the week. He's saying you are a partaker in the blood of Christ and everything that comes with it. He says, do you not know how much of a blessing that is? He says, reason with me for just a moment. All these things that we experience because we are partakers of the blood of Christ. All of the hope that we have because Christ shed his blood for us. And he continues down to talk in chapter 10 and verse 17 about this union, about this uh, unity that's also brought out uh, as, as, the blood, as the body, as the, the bread would represent. He says, continuing down, down in verse 17, since there is one bread... We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. You see, when we look at the body, of course, we're ta- at different places, we're talking about the functionality of the church, and we're talking about the different moving parts and all that, that makes up the church and, and, and all the different parts that, that make it function the way that it is and is a part of God's design, but we're also talking about that unity that it comes be- between us being reconciled to God and reconciled to one another. He says, do we not all partake of this one bread? Are we all not unified with one another, thus uh, also being unified with God? Are we not benefiting from all the efforts that took place in order to make that happen? When we look at the emblems of the Lord's Supper, when we look at everything that we do habitually, every first day of the week, Let us not fool ourselves into thinking that it's just about doing everything right in that act. It's about understanding our proclamation is a part of our participation in that covenant that God made with us. He continues on to teach about the oneness and and, and continues down to, to talk about an example, another example that should relate to them. Paul brings out aspects of Israel's past participation. He continues on to say, look at the nation of Israel and not those who eat the sacrifices sharers in the altar. This is a further reminder uh, of that exclusive concept that should not be new to them. Uh, as, Mo- as the law of Moses uh, was certainly exclusive by design, we, uh, we see people like Peter and we give him a bad reputation at, at different points throughout his development and his growth for uh, for struggling with, uh, with certain things that, that changed once we went into uh, everything that's involved with being on this side of the cross. And we, we look at Peter uh, who went uh, to the household of a Gentile and we say, okay, he struggled with that. Why is it that Peter struggled so much with uh, walking into the house of a Gentile? Why was that prejudice, prejudice something that was so prevalent in his heart? Uh, because he had just preached, uh, seemingly just for us, a few chapters back that the Spirit was going to be poured out unto all flesh. Why didn't he understand that the Gentiles were now going to be involved in this new covenant? Is because he came out of a background where God said, I want you to destroy uh, all these Gentile nations, their, their, their pillars, their way of life, everything. So Peter struggled. So when we think about this idea of participation, as Paul has already built it up in the first part of this book, he said, I am a participant, I am a sharer, I have fellowship with the Son of God. And he says, I am a participant, I have fellowship, I am a sharer in the the gospel as you are. So he says, based on this idea of participation and what it means to share in something, Why do we think it's okay to then go and partake in and to share in something that is against everything that Christ stands for? Why do we think it's okay to then go ahead and mix uh, what God has made pure and holy with that which is trying to do nothing but work against him? It says, as you participate in, in these emblems, as you understand what God expects from you, he says, understand that participation is something that involves your whole life. And he says, what do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or, then, or that an idol is anything? No, 
But I say the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And do not want you to be sharers in demons. Chapter uh, 10 and verse 17, or I'm sorry, verse 19 and 20. So I do not want you to be sharers in demons, and, and I, I hope you didn't come to this lecture hoping to uh, hear a lesson just on demons. Uh, if you want a, a sermon on that, I, I'm sure that Dan Owen can pull one out of his, his hat and, and just you know, give you a good lesson. There's, some, there's something about demons that causes our, our minds to run um, and our imaginations to go kind of frantic, and we want to fill in the blanks. Uh, perhaps where scripture is, has, hasn't, but the point here is clear. Regardless of what you believe about demons, uh, their existence, uh, the understanding of how, um, how it, it works together in the New Testament, regardless of what you believe in the, about those things and how it, it, uh, it, it works together with idols, the point is clear. We cannot be loyal to those forces, to the evil forces that are contradicting and working against in opposition to Christ. He says, I do not want you to participate with Christ and with demons. It is not that they gain any power from the sacrifices uh, that, we, that were made to them. It's not that they become more real because people devote their time and people devote their lives to them. It's the fact that you are dividing your attention. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21. Participation is not just a single act. Participation is something uh, that we see throughout this passage, so we flip to the next slide, is something that means, uh, should mean a lot more to those who proclaim to be a part of the covenant that God has provided to us. But as we see the, Paul reach the end of this passage, at the end, at the end of this section, he starts to say, okay, you need to realize the strength of our jealous God. The idea of God experiencing jealousy uh, is an intriguing one. It's one that, uh, that so, is something that we can relate to because we've all uh, probably experienced it on some level. But here's what the Bible has to say about God's jealousy. Paul says, Shall we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? As God reveals the Ten Commandments to Moses, He says, You shall not worship them or serve them, referring to other gods, for I, the Lord your God, I'm a jealous God. And in reference to this passage in the book of Exodus, uh, he talks about uh, the Spirit and how God jealously yearns for the Spirit. And, and, and as, if you've ever sat at the feet of Michael Hyde in, in, in teaching uh, the, the book of James to you, you see that uh, in context, when we look at what the book of James is after, he's not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that with a, a capital S, uh, so to speak. He's saying that God is jealous of what? He's jealous of that which he created in you that gives you individuality, that which he created in you that is eternal. He says God wants you to choose him. He says this crown that has been promised, this blessing, this honor, has been saved for those who love him. And Paul asks this question, he says, are we stronger than he? When we look at the Lord's jealousy leading up to this in, in, the, God, or in the, the Bible and in, in different places in Scripture, we see in places like Jeremiah chapter 7 where God refers to his people as idolatrous uh, and he talks about their idolatrous practices. And if you look at different places uh, that, uh, that are along the same lines as Jeremiah are in the same place or written about the same time to the same people. It's addressed in a way that, that, it, that expresses this relationship of I, idolatry, but, but, but this spiritual adultery that's going on, and, and sometimes in a very vivid and in somewhat detailed and graphic way. But in Jeremiah chapter 7, you see uh, it says, and they poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger, Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 18. This should help us to understand what it is that Paul is asking them here uh, in verse 22, where he says, we are not stronger than he, are we? Do we want to continue to poke the bear 
Husbands, if you are afraid of a jealous wife, good, you should be. But how much more afraid should we be of a jealous God? We are not stronger than him. God's wrath results from jealousy. God wants us to choose him. God does not want to share us as we flip the next, to the next slide. When we look at our relationship with God, we need to think, what is it that we are causing, what is it that's in our lives that's causing us, it's really actually more causing God to share us with everything else? What is it in our relationship right, with the world that's causing, causing God to share us? God's relationship with us needs to be exclusive. When we think about all the things in the world that are trying to grow, to go after our hearts, to go after our attention, what is it that we need to give up? For them, it was their idolatrous ways, their idolatrous practices. It was fail, help, causing them to fail to partake of the Lord's Supper in a righteous manner. But what is it in our lives, what is it that we are idolizing that's causing us to divide our attention does God wants you to choose him. God wants you to be the one who gives not just your life, but that which he created in you that's eternal over to him for his control, for his will, for his good pleasure. The church in Corinth was struggling with this idea, with this concept. We need to understand that God does not want to share us. Hopefully, as we continue to put our minds back in uh, the first century and, and try to understand from their perspective what it is that God is challenging the church in Corinth to do, hopefully we'll recognize that, that no matter how harsh it seems, no matter how difficult the challenges are, God just wants you to be someone that chooses him over the things of this world. I hope that we learn that in our, our lives, and I hope that we can be people who embrace the exclusivity of our relationship with God. Thank you.